to another edition of the Night Report Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Broadbent. Joining me once again is my co-host, Richie Schneiderite, and here to preview the upcoming tilt between Rutgers and Temple, uh, publisher of the Owl Scoop, the rival's site uh, for Temple, Kyle Gauss. Uh, how's it going, Kyle? Good. How's everybody doing today? Can't complain. Not too bad. Excited for a game, a night game. Uh, this is the blackout game for Rutgers. Um, but before we kind of get into the game, let's talk about how Temple's offseason has gone. Obviously, being at the, uh, you know, outside of the Power Five, you're just kind of, a lot of teams are getting poached for players. Did that, is that kind of how Temple's offseason went? Did you guys lose a lot of guys or not really? Um, not really. I mean, the main one that you would think is Darian Varner went to Wisconsin. And then they had some, um, Kobe Wilson, who was a backup linebacker, went to SMU, where he's starting now. But for the most part, Temple kind of dodged some bullets. I mean, Leighton Jordan was a guy that you thought might, might get NIL. He didn't. Um, I think people always kind of floated the idea of EJ Warner, but I, I never saw that as a real possibility um, just because, like, his family doesn't need the money. So NIL yep. is not really an issue. Yep. Um, but, no, for the most part, I mean, Temple had definitely had some guys that probably could have been poached. Uh, they had some guys declare early, like Jose Barbon, who was their best wide receiver, declare early, um, didn't get drafted, signed with the Cowboys. But for the most part, they dodged the bullet. I mean, they were also three win teams, so it's not like there was yeah. dozens of guys that you know rushed for a thousand yards, and all of a sudden, you know, Nebraska wants them. So um, for the most part, the the team mostly stayed intact. I, I know we just talked about an NIL situation. What's what's Temple's NIL situation kind of looking like? Do they have a bank? Do they have anything at all? Or um, they have a bank in the sense that, you know, when you're like 13 and you get your lawn mowing money and you open up a savings <laughs> account, uh, they have a bank in that sense. I mean, there is the tough fund, which is an NIL collective. Like they have a collective like everybody else. Mm -hmm. um, they have had the ability during uh, basketball with the transition from Aaron McKee to at Fisher. There was some NIL opportunities that got them in the door with some guys that they probably otherwise wouldn't have gotten in with. Mm -hmm. uh, but no, like the, if it comes down to strictly NIL for a recruit Temple's probably not really in that marketplace as of right now. Um, their whole thing that they're selling at this point is what most non-power five schools are selling, which is playing time and development and look at our track record for getting guys in the NFL or the NBA, et cetera. But hmm. strictly bottom line, no, they're not really in that, in that realm. So we talked about guys you've lost. What about guys you've gained? <clears throat> any, any standout transfer portal guys, freshmen, guys coming off injury? Yeah, I think Shiano had a good quote where he said, Temple must have gone shopping in Colorado because I think the <laughs> two best players that they added this offseason both came from Colorado State. Um, okay. Tywin Francis, who Temple will play kind of as like a nickel. They call it an owl on the depth chart because college football coaches always love giving <laughs> the trusting names to nickels. Yep. Um, but he's like he's a safety that can also play in the uh, play more of a linebacker role. He had kind of the game ceiling pick against Akron. I think he's an absolute guy. And I think their best receiver this year is Dante Wright, who was uh, a freshman All American in 2019, had close to a thousand yards, and then kind of got dinged up, and then got that COVID year was kind of a wash for everybody. And then last year, with the whole transitions going on at Colorado State, decided screw this, so I'm just going to redshirt and enter the portal. Um, he had 70 oh, yards against Akron, but really looked like he was still knocking the rust off. But I think transfer portal wise, those are big guys. Alan Hay is a def starting defensive tackle from Miami. You'll see him a lot on Saturday. Um, I think they did a pretty good job with the portal, getting some a combination of established guys like Francis and Wright were established guys. Uh, like they got they got Francis over Virginia. He took an official visit to Virginia, and then right after that, committed to Temple. Right, committed to Temple over UCF. So, like, they got some, like, legitimate guys, and then they're doing what most non-Power 5 schools do, which is, hey, you went to Miami, you went to Florida, die one black, a uh, rush, pass rusher, also from Florida. You didn't really play your first two years. Come down a level, get playing time is is their big selling point. So, yeah, I think they did a good job in the portal this offseason. Yeah, Taiwan what? Francis, uh, he's your highest graded player, according to PFF. He had an 86.2 grade from the first week. Obviously, small sample size, but uh, 14th overall safety right now on PFF. Yeah, no, I think he, I think he played well. Um, and I think that he's also kind of behind him a little bit more is Kamar Wilcoxon, a former four-star guy from Florida. So they did a good job of kind of, um, taking advantage of some of the relationships they might have. Are there like Colorado state temples, former defensive line coach who, uh, was let go to a bit due to a bit of a, a controversy during the off season. Um, right. Basically brought those two guys from Colorado state with them. So, um, yeah. I think all things considered, I mean, it's one game. You'll see how these guys look over the course of 12, 13 games. But right now they have uh, matched their billing. 
What about returning guys? I know everyone likes, wants to talk about EJ Warner. Uh, I mean, our board especially. I think our board might actually have fans of EJ Warner over fans of Gavin Wimsett, but that's <laughs> besides the point. Uh, what? What? Um, he kind of he looks stronger. Am I wrong in that? Or no, I don't think you're wrong. I don't think he's all of a sudden gonna look like Jamarcus Russell out there and be able to mm-hmm. just chuck the ball 90 yards from his from his knees. But I mean, he's he's definitely worked. I mean, arm strength can be developed to an extent. Um, I think obviously EJ Warner's calling card right and his biggest mm-hmm. strength is between his ears i think he dissects plays incredibly well he's very quick to get rid of the ball i mean week one at the get rid of the ball in like 2.2 seconds it was like top 10 ish in the nation that's yeah. a little quicker than last year a lot of that's due to necessity because like we'll talk about a little more but temple's offensive line is still kind of a work in prod, uh, progress so he's he's getting the ball out quick he's making decisions mm-hmm. um but yeah i mean i think he's he's the type of quarterback that i think avoids a sophomore slump like the last great quarterback Temple had was P.J. Walker, obviously. P.J. Walker had a yep. great freshman year, pretty mediocre to bad sophomore year because P.J. Walker relied a lot on his natural God-given ability and his just trusting his arm. I think E.J. is more of a dissecting the play, and I know the ball has to go here or this that I think lends itself to avoid a sophomore slump. So, yeah, I think he's continuing to hit the ground running. He didn't have his best first half against Akron, but I don't think any of Temple really did. Um, and then the second half, he looked more like the guy that over the – second half of his freshman year put up numbers video game numbers uh he set temple's single game passing record and then 10 days later broke it so like as a true freshman he he really kind of um set the bar high for himself this upcoming year and it's only been one game but and he's had one half where i think he's lived up to it so we'll see how it goes on saturday this is year two of the stan drayton era um you guys lost your defensive coordinator dj elliott to the eagles in the offseason yep. Um, you're bringing in a very experienced coach in Everett Withers on the defensive side. Talk about, you know, the general feel for Stan Drayton's uh, tenure in year two and also any other coaches that you guys replaced that are that are uh, worth talking about. Sure. I mean, the Withers thing is interesting because he was on Temple staff last year. He was Drayton's chief of staff. This was off the field. Goes down to FAU to get back on the field. DJ LA gets poached by the Eagles, who I'm wearing on my hat. And then uh, <laughs> they just bring Withers back. So, I mean, I think the, the plan was to have some continuity because they liked the way that um, the defense looked at times last year. It was a, an aggressive defense. They really were kind of up there to the top with sacks and tackles for a loss. So Withers is trying to run that same scheme. Um, he's had some stops where he's incredibly, incredibly successful. Like you look in the 90s and he was kind of like the in vogue defensive coordinator for a bit. But then he's had some recent stops where whether it's based on talent or – the game catching up with him, um, like FIU, he wasn't the best defensive coordinator. Um, when he was the head coach at Texas State, like things didn't go super well. So like there's some confusion. I think he did a hell of a job adjusting against Akron. I mean, anytime you can hold a Joe Moorhead offense to 40-some yards in the second half, that's pretty good. Yeah. yeah. I mean, Joe Moorhead, I don't care if it's the three of us out there, wide receiver, he's arguably the, one of the best offensive minds in the nation. So I think he did a good job in the second half. Uh other than that, people that they've replaced, Jules Montnar, the cornerback coach, went down to ECU, so they replaced him um, with Dominique Bowman, who was at South Carolina. Uh, been good. I mean, uh, cornerbacks are one of those positions where I'm like, is it, is it the coach or is it the talent? Like, I don't care if you're the best coach in the world. You can't make a guy that runs a 4-9 cover yep. slot receiver as well. Um, so for the most part there, the defensive line I talked about earlier, the Colorado State uh, coach, Antoine Smith, was let go by Temple. And they had the opportunity to bring back Larry Knight, who was actually here under Jeff Collins. So they've done a good job of being able to kind of bring in some proven guys um, at those positions, whether that's because of regime changes at their other place. Like like Larry Knight was at Toledo because Georgia Tech fired Jeff Collins 10 months ago or a year ago. But having the opportunity to bring some of those guys in, I think, has been good. But for the most part, there's continuity there, too. I mean, Danny Langsdorf, the offensive coordinator, was off court in Nebraska, Oregon State, has been around for a long time. They they kept him for back-to-back years. There's some continuity there. I think offenses in general, players are a lot more comfortable in that second year than that first year. So um, they, again, didn't really look at it in the first half against Akron, but did in the second half. Um, so for the most part, I mean, the coaching staff has been also able to stay relatively intact. The only guy they really, really lost was uh, Jules Montenard, ECO. You, you talked about the coaching staff, and I feel, I feel like you left out all the Rutgers connection guys. We didn't, we didn't, we didn't talk about Adam. I was waiting Adam, for you to, to bring Adam, up Adam Shire. Adam Shire, <laughs> the best special teams coordinator in program history. No. Um, Jafar Williams, former yeah. Rutgers wide receiver. Marvin Questador. 
Javar right. Williams, I think, in all fairness, and I don't want to put words in his mouth, I think he was probably in the running for some open jobs um, mm-hmm. this year. Like Virginia wide receiver coach came open, which that was mm-hmm. kind of like a natural fit. I mean, he was at Virginia Tech for a while. Yeah. Like, I think, but for whether, better or for worse, whether that's Temple, you know, getting the pay raises or whether that's just, hey, things didn't work out at these interviews. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, Shire's still here. Javar Williams is still here. Running backs coach, I forgot about. Uh, Preston Brown, who I think a lot of people are probably familiar oh, with yeah. from a recruiting yeah. aspect. Um, mutually parted ways is the way I'll phrase that. <laughs> and Temple brought back Tyree Foreman, who was the running backs coach here under Al Golden, Matt Rule, Steve Adazio. He was here for a long time. Huh. I think this is his ninth year as Temple's running backs coach. Um, can really coach the position. I think the the slight against him earlier on was the recruiting aspect. Um, but so far, coaching wise, we'll have to see. I mean, the running backs didn't pop against Akron, but a lot of that comes down to the offensive line. Yeah. I love Tumble's offensive line coach. Chris Wiesenhan, who was back in last year, was at Georgia mm-hmm. Tech, he was at Tumble before under rule. I think he's one of the better offensive line coaches in the nation. It's just getting the right guys in that in that system. Yes, yeah, so let's talk about you mentioned the first game. Uh Temple had to make a fourteen point comeback against Akron. They pulled yeah. out a win. So anytime you can make that kind of comeback, it shows, you know, some of the, the DNA of the team. What kind of happened early on in that game that you guys dug yourself into a pretty deep hole, but obviously you were able to climb out of it? Yeah, I think a lot of it's probably just week one being week one, right? Like, I think mm-hmm. I can see a lot of teams in the nation kind of come out slow. Um, a lot of it's new guys. I mean, Stan Drayton keeps his go-to quote this offseason has been like, hey, I know there's guys like EJ Warner and former Rutgers commit Ahmad Anderson who, like, I've been to war with, but, like, there's 50 new guys on this team. So, yeah. like, a lot of that's them, like, getting still getting used to each other, figuring things out. Guys that weren't in this position last year. I mean, Temple had three freshmen on the offensive line at some points during that game. Kind of came out sluggish. And, the, sluggish. and then uh, during the, the the video they put out after the game of the locker room celebration, Stan Drain said, like, this shouldn't have been close. Like, talent-wise, like, Temple's a lot better than Akron. You can't decide when you want to go full blast. Like, they're not – Temple's not such a good team that you can give 60% effort and expect to beat out the Division One teams. Um I think a lot of it was just sluggishness. It's not like they had no turnovers. It's not like there was, you can point to, oh, EJ Warner threw a pick six and that's why it looked bad. There was one defensive breakdown on like the second play of the game where Akron just dumped it off. There was the safety misread the play and the the running back just takes 80 yards for a touchdown. But other than that, it was just a sluggish game that eventually they got their head screwed on, right? And then they scored 17 straight points to win the game. So uh, I think if you're an extreme, extreme optimist, there's, examples and examples in the past of like 20 temple's 2015 season is the season everyone points to they beat penn state they host a game day they almost beat notre dame they beat a bad umass team by one point in that game because of a blocked extra point like the, the week Jeez. after penn state they were down against umass in an empty foxborough uh gillette stadium for the entire game block an extra point <laughs> come back and win this and that's what keeps their season going so Jeez. i think even the best seasons unless you're alabama or Vince Young, Texas teams, like even the best teams have games where it's like, okay, you just had to find a way to win. And mm-hmm. for better or for worse, they found a way to win, which has only happened four times on the Stan Drain era. So <laughs> I wouldn't I wouldn't uh, be too upset if I was Stan Drain about the fact that the team found a way to win. Yeah. So so I know you talked about the offensive line a little bit. Uh, doesn't sound like you're too high on them, but like looking at – this is just based off PFF grades. You, you got two pretty solid players at center and right tackle? Yeah, I mean, Rich – Am, am I high on them? No. Do I think they can eventually become a decent, like, rush, uh, decent line? Sure. Yeah, mm-hmm. Rich Rodriguez, the center, is a, kind of a proven guy. Uh, he played a little bit there last year, also played guard last year. Uh, and Tumble kind of rotated his, his line around a lot last year. Mm-hmm. And then right tackle, Victor Stoffel is this 25-year-old uh, European who's still just <laughs> kind of as weird as it sounds for 25, learning the game still. It's only really like his second yeah. year of actually seeing the field. Uh, I think he's solid. Um, Temple does single digits to its toughest players, quote unquote. Richard Stoffel is not allowed to wear a single digit because he's offensive lineman, but unofficially he wears number four because he was voted that by his teammates. Huh. And then uh, I, for people that follow Jersey recruiting, Wisdom Corsi should come back this um, this week, so that's kind of like a solid guard. I think that'll help. And then they brought in a JUCO All American, Diego Barajas, who got injured against Akron, missed like forty straight snaps, and then came back in the second half. I don't know if that coincides with all of a sudden their offense looking better hmm. i think those four are probably solid solid i don't know if they're great but they're solid the the issue is temple was rotating in a true freshman left tackle and barajas was out 
a redshirt freshman who had never taken a snap when uh, of course she was out. And then Luke Watson, who's probably going to play um, either left or right guard for them, was was a two star prospect out of Delaware, a guy that just kind of came physically ready to play college football, and they liked him enough in camp that said, "Okay, you beat out Bryce Thoman, who started all last year as a guard." So this is a cliche, but I hope that Temple's offensive line will look a lot better in week like ten than it does in week one, week two, because I think these guys are still learning how to to play together. Yes, we talked about the line, we talked about the quarterback, we talked about some of the pass catchers. Let's talk about the running game. So in terms of your guys' rushing game, uh, who is kind of the lead back? Who are some guys we should be aware of? Is there anybody that really stands out in that running back room? Yeah, I, it's hard to, to grade it because of that offensive line, right? But as yep. far as just talent-wise, I mean, Ed, Edward Sadie is a single digit. He's one of the guys that will kind of stick out um, from, from Philadelphia, will kind of stick out as like this guy's like the leader of the group. Darvon Hubbard. I think is probably the most talented of the ones you'll see. Um, Sadie's kind of like the bruiser in between the tackles. They have an FIU transfer, EJ Wilson, who's more of like a scat back, who's a pass rushing threat. Sadie did have two receiving touchdowns to his credit against Akron, even though he couldn't get it going really on the ground. Um, and then Hubbard can kind of do both. I actually really like both their freshmen, uh, Jocko Smith from Florida and then Kyle Williams from Harrisburg. But I'm kind of thinking they're leaning towards redshirting them just because they do have three upperclassmen that um, all saw the field against Akron. It's a, I'd say it's a better group than the last time Temple played Rutgers because the last time Temple played Rutgers, Hubbard was out, and all of a sudden um, Trey Blair was getting fourth quarter carries, and Trey Blair no longer plays college football. As far as I'm aware, <laughs> I think he transferred out, didn't find anywhere, and then that's that. Um, so I, I would expect, unless something happens in the next you know, 48 hours injury-wise, I would expect that the running backs you see on Saturday are better than the running backs you saw last year. Um, but like I said, unless that offensive line, blocks better than it did against Akron, it might not necessarily matter. Because, I mean, I think Temple's shown over the last year and a half if they can't get things going on the ground game, they kind of just convert to, like, a dink and dunk passing game to kind of get those short yardage things. You'll see EJ throw a lot of, you know, five-yard, seven-yard routes because, hey, if we can't get the ball going on the ground, we might as well just take some easy completions, which is why you see games where he throws the ball 55, 60 times. So what would you say the biggest strength is on offense and the biggest weakness is on offense? I know we kind of alluded to a lot of these things already, but if you could yeah. just pinpoint it. Yes, I, th I think the strength of the offense, other than probably EJ Warner, it, we haven't even talked about it yet. I think the tight ends are legitimately a very good group. Um, David Martin Robinson is a six-year guy. He's been starting for four or five years. Hasn't ever really been able to stay healthy, healthy. I think he actually got injured in that washout of a game two years ago where they moved the game from Thursday to Friday to Saturday or whatever because uh, of the tropical storm or hurricane, hurricane whatever. Uh, he got injured against Rutgers in that game, so he didn't play the majority of that game. Um, when he's healthy, he's like a true dual threat tight end. He can block. He can catch. The real like receiving threat is Jordan Smith. Um, he's a converted wide out from Florida who, the when you really saw Temple's offense kind of take off last year towards the end against when they put up you know 50 points against Houston, 50 points against ECU, things like that, is the tight ends were really starting to get heavily involved. So I think I think that's kind of the strength, again, other than EJ from the offensive perspective. And I think the weakness is the offensive line right now, it, which is I think that's kind of the like the next step in program development. Because I feel like yep. regardless of whether or not it's Temple, you can usually go into the portal or go recruiting and, and find a good like you, you can find a good wide out on a lot of teams in this in the, in the nation. It's really like who has that too deep on the offensive line where. This guy gets injured. We had another guy, another cog ready to just come up and we hit the ground running. That I think kind of separates established teams from growing teams. And Temple is still at that point um, where they are trying to figure things out. Yeah, I know you mentioned EJ before and you talked a little bit about his arm strength and getting better at that and how it's between the ears and all that. How, how was he on Saturday? I know you said the first half, I mean, it's just a wash. Just don't even consider that second half. He was just a million times better. And Oh, I, let me be clear. I still consider the first half. I mean, for better or for worse, like they played poorly in the first half, right? Mm -hmm. Like, so I, I think you have to still factor that in. But in the end, if mm -hmm. if he had probably his worst game in you know six seven games, and he still almost threw for three hundred yards and two touchdowns and no interceptions, yeah. like that's not the end of the world, right? Like you can live with those lumps. Um, I, he hasn't had to do it yet on like the road yet this year, mm -hmm. so we'll be curious with that. I, I think he was just better, and I also think that his I, – I think he did a good job of taking care of the opportunities that presented itself. Like the one uh, – when they scored to take the lead, there's one play where 
he gets like bum rushed and Sadie kind of slips loose and he just dumps down to Sadie and lets him get 18 yards, right? So I think he's just very keenly aware of where everybody has to be at all times. And there's a reason that people kind of talk in cliches when they talk about those type of quarterbacks, those like savant quarterbacks is because they're true. Like, I think he's just aware of where every single person on the field needs to be at all times. He knows his progressions. He's quick with his decision making. And those are all things that while obviously the weight room and everything helps with arm strength, it's more of those like February, March, April, May film sessions and being in the facility and putting in the work to really just get more comfort in this offense. Uh, I mean, he came last year in the summer. He wasn't an early enrollee. He came in June, July, and then six weeks later was starting against Rutgers and yep. trying to figure yep. things out. And then you saw a month and a half later, he kind of like slogged in the mud for like a month and a half. He was okay, kind of just like running the mill. And then the last four or five games really took off to the point that he won conference freshman of the year. He was a freshman All-American. Like he really just kind of made that next step. Uh, I think... I, I think they have the weapons for him to take another step. It's going to be up to that line and up to him whether or not they can do that on a big stage. I mean, a Friday, I sorry, a Saturday night game on Big Ten Network uh, is probably his biggest test in you know in a couple a couple games in, in ten months. So um, I don't discount the the slow start against Akron. I don't I don't wipe that off and give him a clean slate, but um, we'll, we'll be a lot more. I'll have a better idea of which direction he's going, which which trajectory he's on after this game. Yeah, this is, I mean, for Rutgers fans, I'll just kind of go through his stat line. So he only made 10 starts last year, and he threw for 3,028 3, yards, 18 touchdowns, 12 interceptions. And half of those yards came in the final four games of the season, like right. Kyle alluded Crazy. to. He threw for over 1,500 yards in his final four games, 10 touchdowns, two, three interceptions, he set, like you said, he set the single season game passing mark twice last year as a true freshman. These are impressive things for a true freshman who's undersized to be doing at any level of college football. Do you guys see him as a guy who could take another step forward this year? Possibly a guy who could maybe lead the AAC in passing yards because he had 292 yards week one. Is that kind yeah. of the expectation some fans have, Rejo? Oh, do some fans think that? Sure. I mean, well, I think the, that, the middle yeah. of the pack fan. I, I think, there, I think there's some fans that think he's going to throw for 7,500 yards and, and <laughs> set <up> records. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I think I think the hope is that for sure. I think if he repeated what he did last year, that would be a bit of a disappointment now that he has a full year under his belt. And they went out and honestly, they kind of, I mean, Stan Drayton's alluded to this, is they hit the transfer portal offensively for him, like to find guys that like that helped him, that guys that you get the ball in these people's hands and they're like Dante Wright is like get the ball into his hands and see if he can get you extra yards guy. Ahmad Anderson does that. It's get the ball into his hands. Hope he gets extra yards. It's more of just college football is not the NFL. There's always going to be spacing available. If you, you can scheme up spacing, you can scheme, scheme up openness. I think that they are expecting him to take that next step. Um, I don't know what that ceiling is. I mean, I think he's a little limited right now in his arm strength for sure, but I don't think, I don't think if anyone says like he's the weakest armed quarterback in the nation, I don't think that's accurate. I think he's improved on that aspect. I think he has an average ish arm. Um, so I, I think there's that next step in there, but yeah, we'll have to see. I mean, there's no excuses for it. The big issue is from the stats you just listed, what, two wins in that stretch. So like, yeah, you put up all these yep. numbers, you lost in shootouts. So like, yep. I, I don't think. Like, I don't think Temple, I don't think Stan Drain was necessarily like okay with that. Okay, well, we put up numbers, but we're going to lose. Uh, so I think they would prefer games like last week where it's more manageable numbers, 290, two touchdowns, no picks, and Temple won the game. So, yeah, I think, I think, I mean, look, let's, let's just say what it is. I mean, he's the marquee player on this team. Like, his last name makes him the marquee player on this team. His performance as a freshman makes him the marquee player on this team. And, nothing has changed in the last 10 months or so that would make me think like he's not ready to live up to that. I mean, just, just looking at it, like his freshman year is better than his dad's best year in college. So, I mean, yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I know my, yeah. to, yes. yeah. <laughs> completely different, but he was uh, probably wearing like linebacker shoulder pads oh, while yeah. throwing the ball. But... <laughs> that's, that's tough. Yep. Um, more importantly, we have a question on our board and before we move on from the offense, what happened to Dwan Mathis? Did he just disappear off the face of the earth or like, no, he's, 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 he's still there. He played, 
a couple snaps against Akron. He's just okay. the backup big wide receiver. And to be honest, his role will probably be less against Rutgers because they're getting Ian Stewart, the Michigan State transfer who missed week one, mm-hmm. um, got injured last year, actually it was against Rutgers. No, I think it was against UMass. Mm-hmm. Um, he'll be back this week. He's a bigger wide receiver. I mean, Dwan Mathis's hope was that, look, he's a big guy, he's 6'6", six, six, yeah. he runs a 4'4", four, 4'5", four, four, th- uh, 40. You would hope that like that makes you like a receiving threat, and it just hasn't clicked. Yet. I mean, you're talking a guy who's played quarterback for True. the first 20 years of his life, had a traumatic brain injury, came back, started in the SEC as a quarterback, came back, started at Temple as a quarterback, and is now being asked to learn a complete new position. I don't think, as of right now, I don't think they're expecting him to really factor in, especially not this week. Mm-hmm. He factored in towards the end of last year, but that was more just because injuries in the wide receiver group was getting low. So I would be surprised if you see him in a bigger role on Saturday. I think he always has the threat of if he's out there, it's crap, is this a trick play? Mm-hmm. Like you have a division one quarterback at wide receiver, is something going to happen here? But no, I mean, he lost that job to EJ and then quickly changed positions. So like it was a definitive, like done. Jeez. And, and Ahmad is the former Rutgers guy, obviously Rutgers commit. He's starting receiver or not? Because like I, I see, he put up pretty decent decent numbers. No, he's he number starts. Two I mean, when they when they were in three wideouts, he's one of those three wideouts. Uh, mm-hmm. He actually took like a pretty big hit against Akron. He came back, but it was oh. like a is this targeting? Is he going to be able to get off the field on his own? But mm-hmm. um, I mean, he you'll see him like he he's out there. He he plays a fair amount of snaps. You'll probably see him get four, five, six catches, and he also. Um, used to return putts. I think they are going with Dante Wright in that, which is mm-hmm. uh, the correct decision, I think, because Amadi Anderson had a lot of trouble with holding onto the ball in putt returns. So, um, yeah, I think that's another situation where they've developed depth to the point that guys that were filling roles last year are no longer hmm. in those roles because they've been surpassed. But no, yeah. offensively, you'll still see him. I think he's actually a, like a solid wide receiver at this point. Um, like okay. he's he's the same thing. You look at his stats down the stretch last year. He went from having like no stats to averaging like seventy yards a game over the last like five games. So like he started to figure things out too. <laughs> so we've talked a lot about the offense so far. Let's transition over to the defense. Uh, this is a unit that had, and just looking from through the PFF grades from one game, you guys had a lot of guys who really stood out. Let's just talk about the unit as a whole and kind of some. Three or four, maybe five guys we should key in on on the defense. Yeah. Do you notice that when Shiano gave his, like, uh, coach speak press conference, the one area that he couldn't even find some reason to be like, these guys are great guys, where like, it was like the defensive and offensive line. <laughs> like, wait, every other position group, <laughs> you would think that they were playing like the 86 Bears. But with, with the lines, I think he was pretty on the spot. I mean, they're developing guys. Um, I think... Ideally, they wish Darian Barr didn't go to Wisconsin. They wish Demeric Morris, who I think they were planning on playing a lot, didn't get injured. Um, even KJ Miles, Georgia Tech transfer, Jersey guy, uh, he got injured in preseason camp. I don't think you'll be seeing him this okay. year. Um, so like, that's led to them doing a combination of things. It's led to them playing a lot of like Alan Hay, the Miami transfers, playing a lot of snaps of defensive tackle, which they probably would, ex- would want him to play a little less. Um, and then Jaquavian Mahomes, a Kentucky transfer, has been at Temple for a couple of years. He's like a solid, they have two like solid defensive tackles. And then that third uh, spot, because they'll run like a combination of like a 3-5-3 three, three, or a 3-4-4. Four, four. Like they do different things. Um, that, that third defen- down lineman, they've kind of taken some guys that are probably more like true edges and been like, we need you to kind of plug some gaps here a little bit. So you'll see that with... Um, Davon Hood, Davon Hood, who was an East Tennessee State transfer, will do that. Trey Thomas, who's like a converted linebacker, will do that. Uh, defensive line is another that same thing as the offensive line is. They really need to keep building depth there, and and probably really hit the transfer portal hard with that this off season. But for right now, it is what it is. What that's led to is by design and also by necessity is Temple's pass rush is going to come from that next level. Leighton Jordan had eighteen and a half tackles for a loss and you know nine sacks last year. He only played probably 15 snaps against Akron. He actually got like beat out a little bit in the conventional linebacker role by hmm. um, Jacob Hollins, but you'll see him in a, a pass rushing role for sure. I think the linebackers are the strength of the defense by far. In addition to Jordan, I'm sorry, yeah, in addition to Leighton Jordan, Jordan McGee, who is more of a traditional linebacker, I think he's a future NFL guy. Um, you'll see him. He was on, he's on the Senior Bowl watch list. He was a first team All Conference preseason guy. You have Andy Rigby, another. Jersey guy from um, Egg Harbor Township. 
is was the AAC defensive player of the year, the player of the week in week one. I think the linebackers are really, really solid. We talked earlier about the transfer portal and Kobe Wilson went to SMU. I think a lot of that was because Kobe Wilson was entering his redshirt junior year and was going to be a backup again. Like hmm. they're the linebackers are are really solid there. Secondary, Jalen McMurray is the guy that will kind of stick out from cornerback perspective. I think Temple trusts him and Dominique Hill, who's a South Carolina transfer. I think they trust them enough to kind of put them on an island and utilize Taiwan Francis uh, in pass rushing and use, utilize Taiwan Francis down a level to send an extra linebacker. They really kind of trust those cornerbacks. The actual true safeties, Brennan Scott, and whether it's Kamar Wilcoxon and Alex Odom is another guy um, from right over the bridge who I think they're solid to good. Um, I think the real strength is the linebacker and the real weakness is probably that defensive line, at least with this depth. You'll see a true freshman out there in Common Green who played quarterback in high school. Uh, he played quarterback and defensive, I'm sorry, quarterback and defensive tackle. Jeez. And he just kind of showed, another guy showed up to campus 275, physically ready to, to hit the ground running. And he, you'll probably see him 10, 15 snaps a game too. But he was the guy that Shiana was like, yeah, they have a freshman out there. I, he looks big. He looks strong. Like he, he didn't know like defining yeah, just uh, the description about it. It was just like, yeah, he looks like he looks like a strong kid. Yeah. So. Um, linebacker. I know you keep hyping him up, but uh, it's crazy to me that Dewan Black was this huge recruit out of high school and just hasn't done anything really at all. Had, uh, him and Corey Yeoman from Atlantic City had combined for a sack last week. So like he's mm -hmm. kind of in that same role as Leighton Jordan. Like when Leighton Jordan graduates and moves mm -hmm. on, um, Dewan Black will probably fill that role. But yeah, Dewan Black's a guy who. It's always interesting when you get these uh, transfer portal kids, if you go to like what what their fan base thinks about, like the fan that's mm -hmm. sending it. Florida fans were like obsessed with that one black. Like yeah. they loved him. They thought like, oh, Billy's like ruining this. He's running into the ground. He's not using black enough. Um, but I think he's a guy that, yeah, hasn't played that much football at the college level. Uh, he's a, I think he has a lot of pass rushing ability. Uh, I think you'll see him on Saturday for sure. It's just him and Jordan are probably going to, kind of fill that same role so it's one or the other if one of them's on the on the field it's probably a blitz like they're probably pass rushing yeah. he was like a top 150 recruit or yeah. number number like 10 or something juco kid yeah like he was he was, i think yeah. he what he like i think he signed with florida then he went juco and then came yeah. back to florida yep which and is always an interesting route and then oh, yeah entered the portal and i actually i always this is completely probably unrelated i always have like these random memories like when random kids commit and i was mm -hmm. watching knives out on netflix when i want black <laughs> his temple. for some reason that's just like my the memory i have with him yeah it's funny how those things can kind of get intertwined i know what you yeah. mean like sometimes it'll be like the you know the beer i'm drinking at the time yeah. or like the place i'm eating so every time i go to that place again it'll be like why am i thinking kenny fletcher here oh yeah that's because his live i saw and screenshotted from here yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I think we kind of have an idea of where the weakness of the defense lies, and that's mm -hmm. on the defensive line. Where would you say the strength of the defense lies for Temple? The linebackers, yeah. I think the, the strength is definitely linebackers. Mm -hmm. I, I honestly think the back seven or back eight, depending on the formation of Temple, is is pretty solid and is going to keep them in a fair amount of games, at least when it's the conference play, assuming you know they don't get hit by an injury bug or something. It's really just... Games, especially games like this where you're playing an up level, like you're playing against a power five team. The way that like teams like Temple usually lose these games is when they need to get a stop, the bigger conference team can just run the ball six times for 70 yards or for 45 yards, something like that. Like it, it really comes down to are you going to be able to kind of fill those gaps and stop the run game? They did to an extent against Akron, but that's kind of the converse thing where when Akron needed to run the ball, Temple was able to stop them, like because they're playing up a level. So I think I don't know if you can scheme that. I don't know if that's utilizing those linebackers more to kind of fill holes and just trusting them to to get tackles. We talked about this a little bit, um, Richie, like with the Northwestern game. There was like five, six plays where I saw their middle linebacker get into the backfield and just oh, yeah. whiff on a tackle. Yep. <laughs> so like yep. Temple can't do that. Temple needs to be able to not just arm tackle. I don't know if you know if Sam Brown's playing. I don't know if who's really going to be back there. But regardless of who it is. Temple cannot arm tackle these guys. They need to actually tackle. I would hope that Temple's linebackers, who are supposed to be the calling card of this defense, they have two single-digit guys and a, a conference player of the year contender in Lane Jordan should be able to tackle in space. Crazy thing is you're talking about Bryce Gallagher, who whiffed on a bunch and still managed to have, what, like 17 yeah. tackles on the day? Yeah, like, right. <laughs> <laughs> well, when you yeah. have 
when you're going up against an offense that's 14 play well, drives or whatever, it might be. Yeah, you're gonna yeah. somebody has to get tackles. Yeah, I always remember true. with that Tyler Matt Cabbage's freshman year, he had like 140 tackles, and then Matt mm-hmm. Rule comes in, and people are like, "Oh, what do you think about Tyler Matt Cabbage?" He was like, "He hasn't shown me anything. Somebody has to have a tackle. Like there needs to be a tackle on every play." <laughs> yeah, it's like, and then Tyler Matt Cabbage becomes the all-time lead tackler and the NFL guy, but. At the time, he was like, tackles are a meaningless stat because somebody has to do it. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's true. I think it was, what, 32 plays between the first two drives for Rutgers? So, that's like, insane. yeah. <laughs> yeah, there was a crazy stat. Last year, Rutgers only had two drives on the entire season of 15-plus <laughs> plays. And against Northwestern, the first two drives of the season, 16 plays, 16 <laughs> plays. So yeah. they found a way to kind of make uh, chicken salad out of chicken shit so far. Yeah. Did um, they find a way, or did they play the worst Power 5 team? I think it's a little bit of both. Yeah. We played some real bad teams last True. year, too, and we weren't able to do that. So uh, I do think there is the, – the offense is better, and they're more organized, too. Like, Rutgers didn't have any delayed game penalties. They didn't have any illegal formations. They didn't have any, any illegal motions. Like, they played a very clean game. I think they averaged, mm-hmm. like, eight penalties a game last year, seven, mm-hmm. yeah. maybe seven and a half. Uh, and they had two penalties all day, and they all came in the fourth quarter. So one this is a team on, that one is one was on purpose clean. too. Yeah, one was a, a, a delay oh, game a on a punt. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, so that's this kind is a of, team that has cleaned up a lot this year. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of in a way very similar to how I would have described the Temple game for anybody that didn't watch the Temple game, right? Like mm-hmm. Temple didn't turn the ball over against Akron. They had 15 yards of penalties, like very like just clean, do your work, get a win game. So I. The the guy in me that always supports like Team Chaos hopes that that's not the case on Saturday. I hope it's not <laughs> zero combined turnovers and four penalties for twenty yards. I hope mm-hmm. there's some some element to it, but yeah, we'll see. And like What's I said, it? I mean Kirk's Kirk's a pro, right? Like that's yeah. a, a proven offensive coordinator, a Temple guy. He's been doing it for a long time. Um, that yeah, I think I think that's what you expect when you hire somebody like that when you go out and get a proven commodity. Granted, yep. Gleason was also a proven commodity, but that didn't True. work out like that. Yeah, yeah, uh, I think yeah. he was a, a little less. Pro- like he was at he was under you know Sir Sirace at uh, Princeton forever. Then he mm-hmm. went to and ran Mike Gundy's offense for a year in Oklahoma sure. State. I think we re- we realized quickly that you know he was the emperor with no clothes. He didn't really have any like <laughs> of his own ideas. He was just kind of coasting off others. Where's he at now? Uh, but Kirk, is he anywhere? He is an analyst. <laughs> believe it or not, he's an offensive analyst at Northwestern. Mm. So a lot of good that did. Well, yeah, him and Rod Carey can go up against each other. Rod Carey okay. is an analyst at Indiana now, just Jeez. still collecting $3 million a year from Temple or whatever it might be and <laughs> working for minimum wage in Indiana. Hey, whatever, yeah, it's whatever funny how that pay. works out because they yeah. could just, since they have offsetting language in their contracts, they basically do get paid nothing. Well, I would just yeah. they get to learn. I would just not work. Sit home. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, I'm just going to take two years off. Like, let's set up, yeah, let me go coach mediocre Big Ten football teams. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, anyway, what's, what's the feeling like amongst the temple fan base? Are they like excited for this game? Are, are they going to show out a little bit? Cause it is localish. Sure. I mean, I think, I think they're excited. I think it's interesting, not even just from an athletic perspective, but kind of from like a university perspective, I think temple's really kind of going through it. Um, the mm-hmm. last couple of years have been like pretty rough. I mean, not to get too far off. I mean, we literally had temple literally had a police officer killed on campus mm-hmm. last spring. Like there's, oh, geez. there's. A lot of changes come on. They, they fired the president shortly after, like they have an interim president. I think there's just a lot of kind of like beaten dog syndrome a little bit with Temple where they're afraid to get excited at things. Um, I think the like hardcore people are definitely excited for this game. Um, I think you, if you look at box scores or photos from the Akron game, it's more of like that lukewarm fans that showed up a lot in 2015, 2016, and 2017 who were, you know, filling the best attendance games that Temple's had in a long time. They don't, they aren't, they're not showing up right now. Like they aren't because they haven't had a reason to, I mean, Temple's Temple hasn't had a good football season since 2019. They haven't made the tournaments in basketball since 2019. It's been kind of a rough stretch that I think it's uh, in a pro sports town. It kind of takes a long time for college sports to kind of trickle down to that level. Um, so I, I don't think there's like an overwhelming excitement. I don't think if you were on campus this week, it's people like banging, like the beat Rutgers drum. I think they're in kind yeah. of just the, we'll see if the team can win in spite of the lack of support and then we'll support it after the fact. So I think if I had to draw parallels, the parallel I keep coming back to is I'm really hopeful that this is like Temple's 2014 season where they went six and six and the next year took that big leap. I think this team's set up to be better next year than it is this year. But in today's day and age with the transfer portal, you never know. 
because all it could take is whatever, a cornerback that you're counting on hitting the portal, and then you're like, crap, all of a sudden that's a weakness in the defense, and we're not on that same trajectory. So I think there's excitement for this game, but I think there's also just let's wait to see, and then if they beat Rutgers, then maybe we show up for the Miami-Florida game. Yeah, it's it's you guys have a similar problem to Rutgers in the sense that like pro sports rule all in the area, mm-hmm. and you guys have so many big time colleges in Philadelphia too that like you know right after the 2015 season where you guys had like your one of your best seasons ever mm-hmm. in football, you have Villanova start their run. They win two titles sure. in the next three years. Obviously, you guys have you know beat you beat yeah, Temple won the Villanova conference last year. Next year. Yep. Won the, yep. the next year, Temple wins the conference and gets overshadowed yep. by Penn State. Also won the Big Ten and Nova. Yep wins in that yep. like yeah yeah it's 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 tough and you guys you know showed you can do it under matt rule and it's just kind of like you know how are we going to do this in, under in totally new landscape for college sports um and Rutgers is facing the same similar problems to you guys in that sense because we yeah. don't have the money to compete with the likes of ohio state in our conference oh yeah ohio state sure but i've, yeah, also, yeah. I've also seen plenty of basketball recruits lately that would tell me that that <laughs> Rutgers probably has some uh some money behind it yeah, I think we yeah. have some uh, uh, big time corporate interests sure. along um, right. our side. In Maybe Adidas. Temple shouldn't have signed to... with Nike. There you go. <laughs> I mean, I I was really against signing with Adidas, but seeing how they've kind of helped us in the NIL sense, I'm you know overjoyed that we're yeah. with Adidas now <laughs> compared to Nike. Um, so we get a little off track. Let's talk about. I'm going to give you a prompt, and you could just answer it however you you think would fit. Um, Temple wins Saturday if. It's cliche if it's able to run the ball. If you can, if you can tell me that Edward Sadie and Darvon Hubbard rush for like 130, 140 yards combined, I think Temple wins this game. Um, I think the issue is just going to be, I think you're going to see drives where they hand the ball up the middle, Sadie gets one yard, and then they just go crap. I guess we're throwing the ball the next two times. Um, yeah, I would say the ability to establish a running game, which to be frank is something they haven't been able to do. They had one game, if you look back last year, where Edward Sadie rushed for like 260 yards, just blew up USF, like National Player of the Week, all this stuff. And then other than that, I think they've had, uh, it's like they've failed to surpass the century mark in like nine straight games. So if they can if they can give me 125 rushing yards, I think Temple wins this game. And the opposite side of the coin, Rutgers wins this game if? If Temple's unable to stop the run. We just talked about <laughs> it. I think, I think there's going to be a situation where – whether Temple's in the lead or if they're down one score, I think there's going to be a situation where like Temple needs a three and out here and Rutgers is going to be able to just run it down their throat for a little bit and kind of just suck any momentum out of that stadium. Uh, it's another thing where, I mean, look, the atmosphere I think is going to factor in. It's a primetime game. It's a blackout. Um, you're playing up a level. You're playing on the road. Like, I think you'll be able to tell pretty early whether or not Temple's up for like the challenge. I mean, if they go out there and they all of a sudden – uh, just get the crack kicked out of them like they did two years ago when they gave up 61 points against, you know, like a, at the time that was a pretty mediocre Rutgers offense and they put up 61 yep. points against Temple. So uh, I think you'll be able to tell by like the first quarter, like is this going to be just a uh, screw it, let's hope Temple gets out of here healthy or is it going to be uh, like a copy of last year where it comes down to one drive at the end of last year, Temple wasn't able to pick up a second, they were second and short, they weren't able to run the ball and get a first down. And then they weren't able to get a stop when they needed to. So football is, is usually pretty simple. Who can win in the, in the trenches and who can kind of control the clock? And week one, Rutgers can really control the clock. If, if they get a, a copy of that, if, if the game plan that worked against Northwestern works against Temple, then I don't think Temple wins that game. Before we get into predictions here, Richie was telling me, I, I don't know if you were relaying this or not, but – it sounds like this is a game that Temple has had circled on the schedule all off season and are very, very, very excited to play at Rutgers. Is that what you're hearing as well? Is this like a huge game internally for the for the Owls? I think that's but just kind of like the common summertime. So yeah, I think okay. that's yeah. kind of like the common thing that like fans might say, or like, oh, they have this circle in their calendar and blah blah. <laughs> Temple, where Temple is at in their pro- development as a program is like. Yes. Do they want to beat Rutgers? Sure. I know Rutgers fans are going to hate to hear this, but there are p- recruits that Temple recruits against Rutgers for, right? Like they, they're in the yep. same backyard. It's the same footprint. So to be able to say like, hey, we beat Rutgers is obviously a benefit to the coach staff. I don't know if the players are necessarily like, we need revenge. We should have won last year and stuff like that. I think they're just really focused on like every week 
Temple's only won four games in the last 13 games. They're four Niners, San Drayton. Every week is a big game because they just need to establish a winning culture. But, like, yes, is this a bigger game than Temple hosting Miami in, in two weeks? Yeah. Like, because – all these kids played against each other growing up. Like even with the transfer portal, like Temple brought a lot of guys back to like the area from from out of town, but like they still played against these same kids. Like like Harbor Township played against, you know, Millville and stuff like that. Like Yep. I think it's a big game in that sense. And I think it should be a big game from Temple's perspective because it's an opportunity to like look, Temple has a, a cupcake next week in North Norfolk Norfolk State. So if they can win this game and start off three and zero, then like, yeah that's obviously a huge step in the right direction. So it's big in that sense, but I don't think they like looked past Akron to get to Rutgers or anything like that. I think where they are in their development, they're not good enough to look past anybody. So I think I would hope that they were able to focus on it. It's fair. All right, let's go with some predictions. Since you're the guest, we will give you the first crack at it. Uh, Rutgers is a nine to nine and a half point favorite or eight and a half to nine and a half point favorite, depending on what book you're looking at. How do you see this game playing out? Yeah, I think the ESPN FPI predictor or whatever has this like a 25% chance of Temple winning. And like that feels right to me. Like, should Rutgers win this game? Yeah. Is Rutgers a favorite for a reason? Yeah. Is it impossible for Temple to win this game? Is this Temple playing Alabama? No. Like, it's no. possible for Temple to win this game. Do I think Temple's going to win this game? No. I think it's going to end up being exactly what I think it's going to be where I, where I said earlier, where I think there's going to be times where Rutgers is able to carve out a 10, 11, 12, 13 play game. Uh, 13 play drive and just kind of really put the strain on a temple defensive line that doesn't have that much depth right now and just kind of run the ball six yards at a time, seven yards at a time, eight yards at a time. I would say this ends up being what what I say the under what is the under 42, 41, uh, something like that. 44. 44. I'll say I'll say the un, the over hits, but Rutgers wins. I'll say Rutgers 28 Temple. 17, so that'd be 45. All right, Richie, what do you think? Dude, that's pretty close, and I, I got to ask you, how is Temple's field goal kicker before I go with this prediction? I thought he was great until last week. <laughs> I, <watched laughs> I mean, the guy, last <laughs> last year he had like 13 and 14. He's on the, the Groza watch list. He hits a 44-yarder last week and then misses a 30-yarder pretty badly. Um, okay. So, I, again, maybe you hope that that's week one jitters and that he's more of the 44-yard guy. He's, he's probably good within 45. See, now that, that's the decision maker right there. I think I'm, I was going to go 28-10, but I think I might go 28-13 just to there make it a little bit, a uh, couple more field goals so in that's, there. That's the under, I think. Yes. I don't mm. think the un, over is going to touch at all. Rutgers is going to try to skate out of there and get their 24 points. If they're up 14 or more, they're just going to get the fuck out. Like, just run. <laughs> and the new first yep. down rule, it's going to go quick. So. <laughs> Yeah, I think if the over does hit, it's because something like 2021 20, happens where there's a lot of turnovers, a lot of short fields, you know, maybe, a, you know, pick six or two. I I, I also kind of like the over. I think it'll be very close. Like in my head, I was like, this is probably like a 31, 13 type game. I do like Rutgers covering. And it's mainly because, like you mentioned, the line differentials, like Rutgers defensive line is legitimately good. And I do think they're going to give Temple some issues along the offensive line. Rutgers' offensive line, though, is not great. They played a really depleted Northwestern offensive line last this last this past week. I didn't think they got a great push in the run game. They didn't average much in terms of yards per carry last week. I think they averaged as a team like 2.8 yards per carry. Now, there's a lot of third and ones, fourth and ones sure. in that mix, so I think it's a little skewed. I don't think they were as bad as their stats would indicate, uh, but I don't think Rutgers is at the point where they can kind of just bully a team and just, you know, get seven, eight yard runs a clip. I think they're going to have to kind of grind out first downs. Uh, so that's, that's kind of what's holding me back from like really putting a ton of points on Rutgers favor. I'll go 27 to 27 to 10 Rutgers. I, I, I'm really struggling. I know that's the under, I, I'm just really struggling to see how a ton of points are scored in this one yeah. without some some to short a, fields or a postscript to that i would say i don't think either team's gonna run an offensive scheme that like lends itself to turnovers which prevents like, yeah, a crooked yep. number from being put up right like yeah, i think it's, it's gonna, a fumble recovery or something yeah, yeah. like unless something like that like i don't think you're gonna see gavin or ej really like take that many like deep like chuck it and let's hope that these 50 50 balls end up in our favor so i think it's just gonna be like i'm a, like a just get through it see who can get to 24 first and go from there yep. type of game 
Yep, because you said that you know their their offense is a lot of quick passes, a lot of screens, a lot of things like that. Mm-hmm. Which unless you break one free, you're, right. you're thinking four or five yards a catch. So both teams, I think, are going to want to methodically go down the field. Yeah. I don't think either team has a true playmaker where you can kind of you know just throw a yo ball and maybe get a 40, 50 yard gain. Rutgers has one maybe in the works, and uh, wide receiver Ian Strong mm. was one of the highest graded players for Rutgers last week. He only had two catches. One was a touchdown. This is a kid, though, who had been tearing it up all spring and summer. So if there is, like, a big play on Rutgers' end, I think it's probably coming from Ian How's Strong. How's uh, former Temple commit Chris Long looking? Okay. Solid. He's, he's been, a starter. He's been solid. He's been banged up a lot, though. Like, last right. week he had a really nice catch on – uh in like the first quarter and he came up gimpy last yep. year he had like a 60 yard catch against michigan early in the game and he's just been banged up but he's shown some really good flashes we talked earlier about how like you have like recollections of things i was going to the bathroom in the mall and richie texted me a recruiting graphic of chris long he's like here you might need this apparently he's committing to temple yeah and i was like oh, yeah, man. okay i mean the better <laughs> player Brown special who, who yeah. Rutgers was able to scoop Longer up from Temple is Robert yeah. Longerbeam. Yeah. Though he's been a standout player, he would it wouldn't be surprising to me at all if he got drafted uh, this year if he wanted who, to. When he was committed to Temple, that Fran Brown was just like banging the drum for of like, yeah, this kid is he was so skinny, so skinny when yep. he was coming out of um out of Virginia, but Virginia, yeah, yeah. it was just like, yeah, he was just coming down the like this guy's gonna be good. So I mean, Fran's usually right about cornerbacks. They were hesitant on him too because Shannon loves those tall, lengthy DBs, and he was like, oh, what, "What am I doing with this kid?" Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, but... he's been incredible. He's been, you know, for the last two seasons. There was a guy, Kess Abraham, who in twenty twenty one, I believe, mm-hmm. was like PFF first team All Big Ten, like just right. a true standout. And last off season, Longer Bean just took his spot and hasn't yeah. given it up since. No, he's good. I got I got one more for you real quick before we sign off here. AAC, they're gonna add army. It sounds like what what are what is Temple's thoughts on all this madness going on? I think we talked about this last year too. Yeah. Um, well, now we're in a totally different world. It's a whole, it's a whole <laughs> yeah. new world that we were. Yep. Um, it's like the draft draft day quote. It's a whole yeah. new world. There you go. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I, it sounds like they're gonna try to uh, add army, um, mm-hmm. which. From a Temple perspective, that is, I guess, encouraging because when there was conversations like, are you going to have Washington State and Oregon State? If you take away the fact that they were Power 5 teams, that's like the worst possible schools you could have for Temple. Like you're talking like, yeah. let's Travel do flights distance. to the Pacific Northwest to send their lacrosse team to do this. And oh. things like that would have been terrible. Um, it at least is it fits the footprint. I just don't think there's any like obvious additions within the footprint outside of that. Um, unless, like, unless you're willing to like poach into the Sun Belt, which... Uh, I do think it's important to remember that, like, the American Athletic Conference is the ESPN Conference. The Sun Belt is an ESPN Conference. So, like, Mike Oresco, the commissioner of the American, I think is smart enough to realize, like, I don't want to bite the hand that feeds, and ESPN probably doesn't want me diluting one product to boost the other. Army makes sense from that perspective. Obviously, it makes sense from, like, an academic perspective. It's a hell of an institution, but, and it seems like they've gotten things better from the football thing. Temple is again at that point in the development of its program, not just football, basketball, the entire athletic program where like, it doesn't matter <laughs> because like you need to take care of your own craft first. Like, it's not like yeah. temple is going 10 and two. And they're like, we need to get into a power five conference and oh no, SMU le- like left us and got up to the ACC before us. Temple needs to figure out how to win in the AAC before it can worry about like getting to the <laughs> ACC. So um, I think Army would be a good addition. I, I we were talking before the camera start rolling. If I wish that they could also add VCU as like basketball and like all sports, I think that would be a good combination. Like like Navy and Wichita State do now. But in the interim, I mean, Temple needs to just keep winning or not keep winning. Find a way to start winning, then keep winning, and then inevitably the ACC is going to blow up. Right? Like Clemson, Florida State, yep. Virginia, UNC are not going to be there in six seven years. So yeah, once they figure out that grain of rights yeah. loophole no, that even, they're looking yeah. for, even worst case scenario, if like if they never figure it out and that grain of rights goes in there twelve years, well, guess what, Temple, you have now twelve years to determine like, do you want to like invest in your programs, get to the point that you can be there to be the obvious choice because geographically, which is a joke in today's uh, conferences, <laughs> yep. but geographically, Temple is like the definition of a perfect fit for the ACC. Like, you have Boston College and Syracuse, you go down to Virginia, you're missing that little gap in between. Guess what? You have the fourth largest city in the nation right in there. Like, it makes perfect sense, yep. but 
if I'm the ACC, I'm not even thinking about Temple right now because since 2017, 2018, like it's been bad, bad sports. I get like football went to a bowl in 2019. It hasn't come close since. Basketball won the tournament. Uh, not, not won the tournament, made the tournament in 2019. It hasn't come close since. The non, non-revenue sports are just as bad. So, like, you need to figure things out first. Um, I mean, I know it's a little bit like preaching to the choir, but, like, I don't think you can just look at it from a bottom line perspective. Like, yes, Temple Athletics loses sports, uh, loses money. But, like, when they're good, it's such a, a boom for the university and other aspects that that's why Temple continues to invest in it. Now they just need to find the right guys. I do think Stan Drayton is, like, the right guy. I feel like the vi- I'm a vibes guy. The vibes under Stan Drayton are a lot better than the vibes were ever under Rod Carey. Um, basketball, obviously, TBD. Adam Fisher hasn't done anything I like, yet. I like Fisher a lot. I like Fisher, too, but he hasn't he hasn't coached a single game, yeah, right? So, like, you don't know yet. Um, so, you hope that that's on the right track, and then you try to figure things out. But until then, welcome to the America. You could you could, pull a Roth, <laughs> you could do a Rothstein once you guys are doing, just kind of fold into a full high To go to another program. one big conference. <laughs> John Rothstein <laughs> thinks that the A-10 is like the 2008 A-10 or like the 90s A-10 when UMass was there, like when UMass was good and West Virginia was there, and Virginia Tech was there. It's not. It's a one-bid conference. So why would Temple leave a like two, three-bid conference to go to a one-bid conference and make less money? I, I don't need to tell you yep. this, but you see it every time. Every time Temple does something wrong, it's like, they should be an A-10. They should be yeah. an A-10. Yeah. They should just go basketball. And it's like, all right, dude, we get it. Like, Honestly, even you're... the A-10, I mean, for better or for worse, there's there's programs in the A-10 that have better <clears throat> NIL than Temple. Like, UMass really, has yeah. decent NIL. Yeah. St. Joe's has good NIL. Like, there's yeah, – well, that wouldn't be some, like, slam dunk. It wouldn't be like they go down to the A-10 and all of a sudden they win 25 games a year. There would definitely be VCU that has NIL. Yeah, it's true. Like there's there's teams down there in the A10. There's a lot of schools that they don't sponsor football, so all their alums yep. pump money into basketball. Mm-hmm. St. Louis. Yeah, that's such a huge thing to take a look at. Is like one it, a good uh, you know good way to kind of look at it is like what's their endowment and do they only have basketball? If that's yeah. the case, like a Georgetown for example, Georgetown right. has a lot of NIL money. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Loyola of Chicago has a lot of NIL money. The A10 like these schools that. You, wouldn't the, think yeah. the a10 is basically like the biggies light where it's like exactly like what you yep. said it's, it's very similar type of schools where like they don't they have big endowments no football pump money into this outside of like yukon being an outlier um the a10 is just like a slightly less version of that but temple for temple is not trying to be that temple is trying to be like an acc school where it has basketball and football at a certain level so I, I still think if I'm a betting man 15 years from now, Temple's in like the ACC. I just think that the ACC is going to be a shell of what it is now. It's going to be it's going to be basically yeah. like the Big East again. It's going to be Temple, Syracuse, Pitt, and Boston College trying to figure things out. And you don't think UConn's going to make it there? No, I don't think UConn would want to go there. I think, that, think they're scenario, desperate at this point. In that scenario? Why? Yeah. Why would they be desperate? They just won a natty. Not well, I mean, that. they won the natty, but like football wise, they're trying to invest. They're trying to get in the big 12 and it's just not so, working. <laughs> not to go too far off topic, but that's something that should give if you're a Temple fan, like big hope is that all it took was one okay year in football for mm-hmm. the big 12 to be like, see, UConn's got to figure it out. Okay. Like they've they right <laughs> yeah. their ship. Like they won like six yep. games. And when they, they almost yep. got into the big 12 based upon like that wasn't such like, yeah. they really live like their football programs on the right track. They won six games. So if Temple can win six games this year, hell, maybe yeah. another conference goes, their football team's on the right track. Yeah. I'm shocked he's there in Jim Mora. Like, I have all places. Like, yeah. Yeah. UConn? Like, all right. I mean, it's working to accept. Have you, I mean, yeah, have yeah. you covered a game up there? Yeah. it's, so, it's yeah, actually, there's, It was packed this week or last it's, weekend. It's a converted Thursday, airfield. It's a, it used to be an oh, airfield. It's, a, <laughs> it's in the but, middle of nowhere. <laughs> yeah, I'm not saying it's great, but it was yeah. packed. I was like, holy yeah. shit. What the fuck? Yeah, that's interesting. That's a, that, them leaving the American was obviously – bad for temple too because it made temple like the northern man on the wall like mm-hmm. they no longer had anybody regionally north of them so yeah army would fix that to an extent true all right way off topic. Um, <laughs> yeah no this has all been awesome uh but i do want to let you go giving us a lot of time on the pod uh tell us where we could find you anything you want to plug before we we head out here kyle yep i'm on i was about to say twitter but i guess it's x now uh there you go. <laughs> x at, at kyle gauss it's g-a-u-s-s uh al scoop is at al scoop underscore com um we have our podcast if you're really jones in for temple content this week uh the scoop sponsored by al scoop.com or presented by al scoop.com is also available on there where you can do podcasts um but yeah we're out there i think i have two writers not me not being there, we'll be there this weekend. Um, so yeah, we will be uh, 
in Jersey representing Al Scoop this week. Ooh, when are you coming in? I have two kids now, man. It's hard for me to come oh, so to go like, places. Oh, so, oh, so you're not going to other two. I'm, I'm not oh, going. Okay, okay, uh, gotcha. My editor, my John, one of my editors should be there. One, one um, of them hates me, I know, from our, my Temple tweet like in the off season. No comment. <laughs> I think, I think <laughs> it was a hoops tweet. I, I did not speak for John DeCarlo. Um, right, fair enough. And then, yeah, I think we also had a couple interns there as well as a Phil talk. But, uh, yeah, I, it was my daughter's uh, birthday party this weekend, which Ooh, was supposed happy, to be last month. Happy birthday. And then we all got COVID. Oh. So we pushed uh, back. Uh, I feel you there. I had it a couple weeks ago. So yeah, it hit, this is the first yeah. time I've ever like actually like felt it. Oh, this, true, this yeah. strand. It's yeah, bad. yeah. But yeah, we're all fine now. Good to go. That's good to hear. Well, happy birthday to your daughter. Yeah. Thanks once again for coming on the I'll pod. It. Thanks. I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah. Tell uh, some stranger on that I did a, a video call with said happy birthday, honey. Uh, her, no, the no only presents. words she says right now are daddy and Spidey for Spider Man. So we'll see how she responds to that. <laughs> I really yeah, thought tell, you were going to say her owl, temple. Like, <laughs> just points at things that call him Spidey. Oh my gosh. All right, guys. Well, thanks for listening. Uh, this has been another edition of the Net Report Podcast. Signing off.